year for hay fever sufferers with unpredictable pollen levels. But we tell you if a 36 pence wonder drug can stop the sneezes. Plus, we've got some free money wins, including how to earn cash by using the right kind of card for your everyday spending. And millions of Brits use WhatsApp every day. We warn you about the group chat scam where fraudsters are infiltrating community and even prayer groups. Welcome to Tuesday's Morning Live. Good morning to Money Queen, Laura Pomfret, Dr Ranj and Strictly Pro, Neil Jones. Thank you for your company this morning. Right, we want to discuss a new road safety campaign underway in France. The government, I do love the French, and this is partly why. They're worried about the rising number of serious accidents, especially involving men. The official advice from the government is, going forward, the best thing men can do is adopt the driving style of a woman. Drive like a girl. Mm. Discuss. Why not? 84% of fatal road accidents, 93% of drink driving crashes are caused by men. So in France. Saying, in France. Women are eight times less likely to be involved in a fatal accident than men. The arguments in living rooms around the country right now will be real, won't they? <laughs> Do you argue with the husband about the driving? Wait, no, well, he might argue with me about mine. But um, but I feel like I'm a really safe driver and I like that angle. At first I was getting ready to be a bit, is this a bit sexist? But but is it the right way? I don't know. <laughs> I'm here for it. I feel like there's there's a lot to be learned from this campaign. Mm. I like it. She was about to set fire to a bra. She was ready. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. no, I'm with the French, yeah. Clearly no one's ever been in the car with my other half then. <laughs> oh, you're a brave oh, man. You are a brave man. We'll start Neil. some discussions uh, for sure. You may have seen on breakfast this morning also a big, big story. A senior doctor is suggesting a popular diabetes drug called Azempic. You will have heard of it, I'm sure. It could also be used to treat obesity and heart disease. Dr Oscar has been following this story mm -hmm. for us on Morning Live, hasn't he? So we'll catch up with Oscar a bit later on to find out exactly what's going on uh, with that. At 9.40 this morning, we're putting some cosmetic giants under the microscope as we investigate the dangerous growing trend of children using anti-aging skin care. Some children as young as 10. I know you feel strongly yeah. about that. We'll get your yeah. views on that as well. Everybody watched that film and went, what? Yeah. It's definitely worth a watch. Many people with sight loss are waiting for years for a guide dog. Presenter Amal Latif visits a team at Glasgow University that uses robotics to come up with a cutting-edge lifeline. That is at 10 o'clock. Yeah, and this incredible moment mm. where he first takes that robotic dog for a walk. It's, it's amazing. Uh, also, at 10.20, we're tackling stress in the workplace. Presenter and mental health campaigner Ben West meets a team of firefighters to explore different ways to combat the pressures of the job, including how holding a piece of ice could ease your anxiety. All that plus Michelin star chef Marcus Waring is here. He will be telling you about his latest show, Simply Provence, and why you should never cook with extra virgin olive oil. Frankly, I'll do anything Marcus tells me no, to do. Everything about that's beautiful. Everything it? about him. Absolutely, yeah, him. He's cooking. Provence, France, yeah. I wonder if he drove there. Um, Neil, leading yes. us in Strictly Fitness uh, uh, today. Samba. Samba week. Joe Wicks had a shot yesterday, didn't he? He was brilliant, though, wasn't he? <laughs> he, wasn't bad. he got better as he was, his hair was flowing with the movement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his, his hair actually had more rhythm than his body, but it was, it was good. It was good. He's, he's watching today. What have we got? Uh, Samba week. So we have got <laughs> Danny and OT, and we've got the chest pumps. We're going this back and forth. So I'm going to teach you how to do that, how to get the best chest pump. That'd be great. And also very exciting. You brought some friends with you. I've got my dancing friends in. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually got pals. Yeah. Hi guys. Diane and Vito. Why are they here, Neil? I don't know, but I didn't get the dance memo, you know, the whole double je denim. What's going on? Uh, no, we're here to talk about the tour. We're on tour. It's good to see you. Thank you for getting up early to see us. Yeah. <laughs> Do they speak? I don't even know. Oh, you want us to speak? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> We are speaking. We are speaking. Sorry, we're speaking. Stop Hello. talking now. Good no morning. More talking. Good morning. <laughs> Diane and Vito. I like the way he just kept waving at us. <laughs> we didn't get. We got the denim memo, but not the talking memo. Sorry. 
Listen, they've had a very busy couple of weeks oh, up and down the country. Bringing joy, we'll be talking about the tour a little bit later on the show. And you'll have to give our ranch some advice because he is also going on tour under the bright lights, aren't you? I am. Um, OK, bit of exciting news. Uh, this is completely dream come true stuff. I am going to be making my musical theatre debut in the UK tour of And Juliet the Musical. Amazing, amazing. I know. I, I've seen Range on stage <laughs> and he is very, very good. So, and oh, I know you're excited about this, aren't I'm you? I'm so excited. All right, bit of a change in career direction for me. I've been wor working really hard to make this happen behind the scenes. I'm so incredibly excited. And we're going to be going everywhere from Blackpool to Wolverhampton to Hull. Um, and the best part of it, this is absolutely the best part, we are opening in Manchester, just over yeah, there at the yeah, Opera House. Yeah. So you're all coming? Yeah. 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 We'll be there. All right, sure. everyone, I'll see if I can get us all tickets. Congrats, man. <laughs> absolutely brilliant Thank news. you. Look forward to that. Okay. Um, we need you for something else very different yes. uh, this morning. We're talking hay fever, aren't we? So many yeah. people suffer, millions of people suffer with uh, hay fever. The, the pollen counts have been sort of really random over the weekend. There was a surge in some places around the UK. But the thing is, sometimes you don't know whether you've got hay fever or, or a cold. So let's start there. How do you tell them apart? Well, there's lots of symptoms that obviously overlap. The runny block nose, the sneezing, coughing, loss of smell, uh, feeling tired, it, feeling tired, etc. But there are a few symptoms that are very specific to hay fever, I would say. Firstly, the itchy red and watery eyes. That happens because of that local reaction to pollen. Itchy throat, mouth and nose and ears. Again, that reaction to pollen that's happening. Pain around the sides of your head, sometimes in your forehead, that's usually due to sinus congestion. Then a mu you generate loads of mucus in both conditions. In colds, it tends to be thicker and stickier because the idea behind it is to trap germs. Whereas in hay fever, it tends to be slightly more watery. Your face is saying it all. <laughs> I know. And the final difference, I would say, is the lack of fever. So in hay fever, you won't have temperature, whereas in colds, you will because it's a mechanism to fight infection. Important things to remember otherwise, hay fever tends to last for weeks, even months sometimes. Colds, usually over and done with within about a week. But critically, both colds and hay fever can make asthma symptoms significantly worse, so bear that in mind. Your daughter's been suffering with some of these symptoms, hasn't she, Laura? She really has. So she's not been poorly, but for three, four weeks, coughing, sneezing, like, uh, sounds like she's got a cold, sounds like yeah. she's congested. And I keep thinking, do I need to get her, like, cold remedy or do I need to do something else? I would say, in answer to that, if it's happening sort of, if there's a pattern that's happening every year around this time yeah. of year and you don't have accompanying symptoms of a cold, it could be something like hay fever. And actually, it's well worth just doing a trial of a, an antihistamine. They're pretty safe. Do that, see if it helps, um, and it might just do the trick. Mm. Okay. And if you're going to go for an antihistamine, remember in kids, during the day, if they're going to school, get a non-drowsy one. If they're struggling to sleep in the evenings, a drowsy one may be I good. Try it. Good to talk through the differences there between a cold and hay fever because yeah. a lot of people will now establish whether they've got one or the other. If it is hay mm. fever, yeah. what are the best ways to... to Fortunately, lots of it. things we can do. So firstly, try and stop the pollen getting to those places in the first place. So um, you can wrap around sunglasses. Some people find wearing a mask helps it prevent it getting into the nose and the mouth, wide-brimmed hat to stop it settling on your face and your hair. Um, putting a bit of petroleum jelly just inside the nostrils, what does that do? It traps the pollen that might just get in there and it makes it stick to those bits as opposed to going inside. If you're going to go outside, try to avoid doing it, doing it in the middle of the day when pollen counts tend to be higher. Mm. And when you come back in, if you've been out for a long time, Change your clothes because they trap pollen and wash your hair because, again, pollen sticks to it. Keep windows and doors shut as much as possible during the daytime. Vacuum regularly around the house and use a damp cloth. Damp dusting is good. Um, cold compresses on the eyes and face are really nice. Salt water rinses for your nose to wash out the pollen. Um, pollen filters, HEPA filters and things like vacuums and stuff like that. Um, and obviously keep an eye on the pollen forecast. Mm. Loads mm. of things to ease the symptoms because it can be so debilitating, yes. can it? But what about prevention? What should we specifically avoid? Yeah, it is debilitating. My brother's got it and he's got it really, yeah. really bad. Yeah. Um, I would say things like avoid uh, cutting the grass or walking out on freshly mown grass and so maybe avoid Look, mowing the lawn this summer, maybe get someone else to do it in the family. Um, don't spend too much time outside um, during peak seasons, especially in the middle of the day when counts tend to be high. Um, try not to keep fresh flowers inside the house, obviously they generate pollen. Don't smoke or be around smoke, it makes symptoms worse. And 
critically, don't dry your clothes outside if you can avoid yeah. it because yeah. pollen sticks to them. So especially things like bed sheets, if you dry them outside, which we all love to do because it smells great, yeah. um, they will trap pollen and then you'll put it on the bed and it will basically just ge <sighs> generate a little pollen bomb inside your house. Mm. Good tip, sir. It is. Um, then we come on to medication, yes. don't we? What's good to use? Um, so, classically, antihistamine, eye drops, sprays, um, tablets, they calm down that allergic reaction in the upper airway. Ideally, try and start them a few weeks before pollen season starts. They tend to be a bit more effective then. Moving on to slightly stronger sprays, steroid nasal sprays are really good. I'm going to show you an example in a second. Um, they are stronger than antihistamines, um, but they do take a bit of time to work. And you can get combined antihistamine steroid nasal sprays. Classic one, one of the examples is Dimista. Really, really good combined spray, uh, which has benefited a lot of people. Again, try to start them a bit earlier than pollen season because they take a bit of time to work. Um, when using the sprays, though, critically, and I've got a little prop to help me here, make sure you know how to use a nasal spray. A lot of people do it wrong. So what I would say, shake it, blow your nose, make sure it sprays and actually works. Tilt your head slightly forward, use one hand, my earpiece has just popped out of my head, <laughs> use one hand to spray the opposite nostril. So you aiming, you put the nozzle just inside the nostril, you're aiming for the opposite ear, so you're sort of firing outwards, spray it in, and then don't sniff. Oh, don't sniff. You, no, I you always it, sniff. I no, always you try not to sniff. You want it to coat the inside of that nostril. And you, um, you might get a bit of a taste down the back of your mouth when it trickles down, but don't worry about that. But classically, that is how to use um, a spray. There's lots of videos online that can help you with that. With antihistamines, antihistamines remember, some can make you sleepy. We talked about that earlier. You might want to try non-drowsy ones. Um, and most hay fever remedies are available over the counter, so chat to your pharmacist. But if you're still struggling, speak to your GP. We can sometimes prescribe stronger antihistamines or stronger courses of steroids and even um, a treatment called immunotherapy where we inject a tiny bit of pollen in under the skin and that desensitizes you. But critically, again, has to be started months before hay fever season starts. So it's too late now, but might be worthwhile thinking about next year. What about some over-the-counter remedies? Because there's been a couple of headlines around yes. about something new that might be available. Yeah, it's not new, actually. Fexafenadine is what we're talking about here. It's a medication we've used for a long time, usually available on prescription, now available over-the-counter. Very helpful for a lot of people. But remember, it can be taken by anyone over the age of six, but you can't drink orange, apple or grapefruit juice while you're taking it because it can increase your risk of side effects, including headaches, drowsiness, dry mouth, nausea, dizziness. And people with certain conditions like liver, kidney, heart problems, epilepsy, shouldn't take it either. OK. Uh, we bust quite a few myths on, on, on Morning Live. We do. When it comes to medical advice and, and headlines. Uh, Will, this is a good one. Mm -hmm. I heard this one before. Will says, does eating local honey help with hay fever? This is a bit of an old wives' tale, unfortunately. Lots of people believe this. Um, there's very little scientific evidence behind it. In fact, it doesn't really help. The idea is that if you ingest a bit of the local pollen, it desensitises you a little bit. It doesn't really do a great deal. And also remember, with honey, you can't, you shouldn't give it to children under the age of one because of the theoretical risk of botulism. And also using honey with children. Remember, honey is made of sugar. You've got to think about their teeth. Diane in the corner is gasping away. Yeah. She's been <laughs> investing in local Didn't honey. Didn't say a word, and then we Sorry. started talking about honey. She was in, <laughs> wasn't yeah. she? Yeah. Before. Yeah. That I, was very helpful, Dr. Ange. Yeah. I loved that. Thank Lovely. you. That's why she's here to do commentary on the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So we love to hear from Diane. We love to hear from you. Yeah. If you've got a question for Dr. Ange or any of our experts, you can email morninglife at bbc.co.uk or WhatsApp us on 0800 032 1100. The quickest way is to scan the QR code on the bottom of the screen right now please don't call it it's just for messages social media platforms like whatsapp instagram and facebook are not only great for staying in touch with people but really helpful at keeping you up to date with the latest trends multi-step skincare routines have soared in popularity online but presenter katie thistleton has been investigating how they could be influencing children and leaving them with irreversible skin damage at 34 years old, I'm at a time in my life that seems quite acceptable to start thinking about how I might age. And through ageing filters on social media, which use AI to enhance facial features and predict how you might age, I'm able to get a glimpse of how I might look in the future. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not too happy about that. As part of my anti-ageing skincare regime, I found that some of the products can come with risks. 
when I ended up with burns around my eye after using an ingredient called retinol. I'm concerned about a new trend, which is seeing kids using anti-aging skincare products designed for adults, and views on videos like these are in their millions. Back in 2022, Claire's 12-year-old daughter Amelia started an extensive eight-step skincare regime she'd seen on social media. I just wanted to make my skin look better than it was, and I thought that me using it would be fun. Some of the products Amelia had bought from the high street contained retinol, the same ingredient which burnt my face. I woke up and it was in like a few places on my cheeks and stuff, just like a rash. It was really angry and sore looking. The skin started to flake and some parts were weeping. It looked painful and then it got to the point where it was clearly infected. Following doctor's advice, Amelia was given cream and antibiotics, but it didn't improve. A few days later, she woke up with red eyes and doctors became concerned it could be cellulitis, a serious bacterial infection of the skin. They said, you need to go to A&E straight away. That sounds really scary. Cellulitis is really serious, isn't it? Yeah, it was scary. And then the doctors were saying, like, it, it could lead to blindness and things. And I just didn't think that any of that would happen from using a few products. Have there been any lasting effects after this incident? She had to go on to prescription antihistamine just to kind of lower this histamine response. And her skin kind of sees everything as a threat now. And so it reacts to things that normally it wouldn't react to. What would you advise other people your age, Amelia, now if they were going to sort of embark on a skincare routine? Not just to go like straight in and use loads of stuff that you've never used before and just use more simple stuff rather than a big whole eight step routine or something. Morning Live has been investigating what skincare brands are doing to inform younger consumers about their products and any potential risks to their skin. We've looked at products containing retinol from five of the most popular skincare brands featured on TikTok. The Ordinary, CeraVe, Nivea, Drunk Elephant and Glow Recipe. One brand, The Ordinary, did carry a warning on all of its products with retinol to keep out of reach of children. The other four brands did not have any age restrictions. Nivea said its retinol products should be introduced slowly and aren't suitable for all skins. CeraVe had one product with retinol designed for post-acne skin and says it's suitable for sensitive and younger skins, but again, it said use should be built up slowly. Drunk Elephant also said to start slow with one of its three retinol products, but otherwise said retinol is absolutely safe to use and on one product even stated any age can benefit from using the product. Dr Faisal Ali is a consultant dermatologist. Dr Faisal, what skincare trends are you seeing at your practice? So what we're increasingly seeing now is children coming in with a multi-layer, multi-step skincare routine that is often unnecessary. And these are children that sometimes as young as seven or eight, there's differences between uh, children's skin and adult skin. And sometimes things which are appropriate for adults might not be appropriate for children. Are there any particular chemicals in these products that you're worried about? The things that I warn people to be cautious of are things which might irritate the skin things like retinoids, so retinol, retinaldehyde, tretinoin, adapalene. If you have acne, if you have uh, pigmentation, if you have wrinkles, they're an excellent product to use. But in young children, their skin is full of collagen, it's generally well hydrated, and often retinoids are not needed. Potentially, they're exposing themselves to a risk of harm, uh, but without any particular benefits of using them. The other group of products which can often irritate the skin are acids. So glycolic acid, salicylic acid, mandelic acid, again, in some cases may be needed in adults, but often are not needed in children. Does it worry you that people get their skincare advice now from social media? Overall, I think it is helpful that people are looking after their skin, children, teenagers, adults alike. I think what is more disconcerting is when you see products which are perhaps marketed using brighter colours, maybe cartoon type characters, which might be interpreted as appealing more towards the younger end of the spectrum, perhaps containing ingredients which might irritate the skin. When it comes to choosing skincare products for younger skin, it can be challenging for parents like Sarah, who is mum to Sienna and Isabella, aged 10 and 12. They both have a more extensive skincare routine than I do. It's quite a ritual, really. And I think where the difficulty comes in as a parent is it's hard to know whether they're doing the right thing or potentially doing anything damaging. Do you think companies should be clear about who should be using these products and who shouldn't? Especially like when it's so obviously being taken up by younger people. And if there are ingredients in there that are actually damaging, then it should there should be some kind of a lower age 
warning. Dr Faisal Ali has some advice for Sarah when it comes to her children's skincare routine. Use a gentle cleanser, a moisturiser and also a sunblock. When you're looking at different moisturisers and cleansers, avoid ones that contain a high proportion of alcohol because alcohol can be dehydrating on the skin. Beyond that, I'd say there's no real need for children or teenagers to be using anti-aging products. Anyone can check the labels to see what's in the products they're buying. But companies like Boots are making efforts to better inform younger customers by rolling out additional training for its beauty specialists. And stars like Drew Barrymore are taking part in Dove's Face of 10 campaign, raising awareness about children and teens using anti-aging products. We have to figure out messaging that empowers women and also lets young girls know that they have so much road ahead of them and they don't need anti-aging. As we get older, it's understandable that we might start to think about what we're going to look like in later life. I'm aware of it because I'm an adult, but children certainly don't need to be worried about that. So maybe skincare brands should be making it a little bit clearer. You cannot underestimate how stressful skincare can be for teenagers and young people. Please think carefully before you put anything on your face. Uh, and we know this is something, Range, that you're very concerned about, aren't you? Yeah, this is one of my bugbears, actually. Um, so multi-step skincare routines are not essential for the vast majority of people. Um, but also there's this trend to using active ingredients, especially by young people, which we're seeing on social media. Not only is that completely non-essential, but some of those active products can be harmful if they're used in the wrong mm. way. So people really start need to take more responsibility about this stuff, especially the manufacturers, I think. Mm. We saw some quite extreme reactions there. If a child in your care has had a reaction, what should you do? If it's a mild reaction, just stop using whatever it is, um, moisturise the skin, protect it using a, some, an SPF. If it's a significant reaction and you're worried, please speak to a healthcare professional because you don't know what's causing it and you might actually need medical treatment. Mm. We've got more here. We contacted the Cosmetic Toiletry and Perfumery Association. Uh, which says it is concerned by the trend of young people using anti-aging skincare products, uh, which should not be encouraged um, because they are not for children. Uh, they are developed for and tested on adult skin. It says there are strict safety laws for cosmetics. For children, the focus should be a simple washing and toothbrushing regime protecting the skin from the sun. Uh, now then, we are turning our attention to the latest warning from Action Fraud after it received over 600 reports of WhatsApp group scams. Investigative, investigative, go on, you say it. You forgot your toothbrush, that's why, investigative. Oh, well done for nailing that. You did that with me the other day with something as well, didn't you? I had my teeth in. Thank goodness you're here. Uh, journalist Hayley Hassel is here to make sure we get the message. Uh, what's been going on with this, Hayley? So this is all about criminals trying to get access to your WhatsApp account. Now, what they will do is try and infiltrate a large group WhatsApp chat. Now, when I say a large group WhatsApp chat, that might be things you're involved in um, with loads of people. So it might be a religious group, a church group, um, a sports club, maybe be your kids' school have a WhatsApp group. So although you're involved and you swap and share information, you don't perhaps know everybody personally that's in the group. So it means it's really easy for a criminal to get access and be admitted into this group. And once they're in, they can see everybody's contact details. And there are so many groups for so many different yeah. things with so many people in them. You've got no idea who they are. Once they're in, how does the scam work? So once they're in, they've got all those telephone numbers and profile pictures of people, and they will then contact somebody in that group. If that's you, you'll receive a voice call or an audio call, and it will be someone from the group chat you're already involved in. They'll probably have a really friendly profile picture, so maybe they'll be with their kids or a pet, and you'll think, well, I don't know this person personally, but I trust them, they're in the cricket club. Mm, yeah. So you answer the call and you speak to them, and they say they're going to set up a group live chat, and so they're going to send you a six six-digit code. Once you give that six-digit code to the criminal, they have automatically access and control over your WhatsApp account. Now, you can see on the screen here, this is an example of the sort of thing you'll get. It's a six-coded number. And if you give that to the criminal, they ha have full control of your WhatsApp account then. It says at the bottom there, do not share that with anybody. Now, that is serious. Don't share it even with your family and friends because that's the way you get access to that WhatsApp account. Yeah, and then if you're in there, I mean, you've got control. You can do all kinds of different things, can't you? Yes. So they then can contact anybody from your group WhatsApp chat because they've got 
your account, it's got your profile picture on it, and they've got the numbers from those chats. Now, they don't have access to all the contacts in your library, but they do have those contacts from the WhatsApp group chats. They can then contact somebody as you, impersonating you, and ask for money or personal information. And it doesn't take long for somebody to oblige thinking you're that you're their friend or their family member and hand over money. They can get a lot of money in a short amount of time. Mm. This is really scary, but I don't feel like we can avoid WhatsApp groups because they're everywhere. Yeah. How can people protect themselves? And you're right, and sometimes they can be used for really good things. But firstly, never share that six-digit passcode because that gives the person who has the code full control over your WhatsApp. Um, you can also set up two-step verification. Um, now, I think we've got an example of this on the screen. You can go to settings, account, two-step verification, and that gives you a separate passcode or PIN code that only you can have access to. Um, you can also do something that's called silencing unknown callers. So if anyone calls you and they're not one of your personal contacts, um, it means you don't get the call automatically. You can think about it and maybe call them back if you do really know them. There's also something on WhatsApp called privacy checkup feature and this guides you through various different things that you can do to protect yourself. One of them, a really good option, is taking off your profile picture to anyone you don't know mm. because then that picture can't be by a criminal to impersonate you. Mm. And finally, if, if you get a dodgy message or something you don't think is quite right from a, someone who says they're in your family or they're one of your friends, just give them a call and check that it is them. Mm. Um, that's great. That's some great advice there. I mean, it's worth sitting down with someone who likes their IT and getting through that to make yeah. sure you, you nail it, to, to make sure you're, you're safe. But if someone, unfortunately, hasn't been able to mm -hmm. do that and they have been caught out, what should you do if you've been part of this scam? OK, so there's a couple of things. If you get a suspicious message, you can block and report it. Simply put your thumb on the message and you can choose to block or report that caller. And secondly, you can report any crime to Action Fraud if you live in England, Wales or Northern Ireland. If you live in Scotland, you can report it to Policing Scotland on their non-emergency number. Yeah, we know the more you report, the yep. less it happens, hopefully. Yep. What have WhatsApp said about this? So they've told us that all personal messages sent on WhatsApp are protected by end-to-end -end encryption, but we can all play a role in keeping our accounts safe. Uh, they recommend that all users set up that two-step verification I was talking about for added security, and they advise that people never share that six-digit code, even with friends and family. And if you receive a suspicious mes message, they say, even if you think you know who it's from, um, request a voice note or give them a call. It's the simplest way to check someone is who they really say they are. Interesting. Okay. Um, my WhatsApp turned green, the messaging turned green last yeah. night. Yours has been like it for a week, hasn't it? You haven't noticed. I turned green. fire, I tried to look at it. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> uh, thank you, Hayley. Uh, technology is not only helping us communicate, but is now assisting the thousands of people with sight loss to beat the long wait for a guide dog. A team from Glasgow University is trying to help by using robots and AI. Presenter Amal Latif has been finding out more. <laughs> Guide dogs have been supporting people with sight loss in the UK for over 90 years. Having spent all my adult life with complete sight loss, there has been moments where I've considered getting a guide dog. I haven't done it yet, but the thought of having a canine companion by my side is nice. Come on. Good girl. Straight on. Clever girl. Deborah from Glasgow has been visually impaired since birth and Rye is the third dog that's helped her navigate the world. She gets me out and about, makes me more independent, not having to wait for people to come and pick me up and take me out. We give each other confidence. Oh, she's more than a dog, she's my companion. So Deborah, what if I was to say that there could be a robotic guide dog <laughs> that could guide you around? Not for me, I prefer my, my furry friend, but I do see that there's certain situations that probably would be better for some people, maybe allergies, maybe just convenience, because the dog's a lot of time and effort. I can hear Rai saying, don't replace <laughs> me for a robot, please. It's all right, darling. <laughs> Rai can rest easy. There's a shortage of dogs like her in the UK. In fact, with around 2 million people living with sight loss and fewer than 4,000 working guide dogs, some people have to wait more than a year to be matched with one. To help bridge that gap, scientists here at the University of Glasgow have come up with Robbie the Robotic Guide Dog. OK, so he's not as cute and cuddly as a real dog, but this AI-powered robot uses sophisticated sensors to learn the layout of buildings, recognise objects and avoid obstacles, 
and it could be a game changer for visually impaired people. Dr. Ola Papula is part of the team that made him. You know what, Dr. Ola, I'm like so excited. I never thought that in my life I'd ever be working with robots. It's like a sci-fi come to life. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Robbie, like, what can he do? Robbie can actually listen to command and execute them. So you can ask Robbie to take you from point A to point B. Take me to the bathroom, take me to the bedroom, and Robbie will do that easily. So how is Robbie different from existing technology out there? So the key navigation solution out there currently is the GPS solution, which we have in our cars and on our phones. But in indoor spaces, the accuracy of GPS is very, very low. We have equipped Robbies with sensors that will learn about the environment. It will scan and map the environment. By forming its own map, it will be able to accurately help persons navigate the indoor spaces safely. So Robbie will make it possible to have accurate GPS indoors? Accurate navigation indoors, yes. At the moment, Robbie only works indoors, but he does have one special feature that our canine companions don't. Robbie can hold conversations. He can ask Robbie things about the environment. With a normal guide dog, the guide dog can show me affection, lean on me, we can build a rapport. But what you're seeing here is like, I can talk to Robbie, Robbie can talk to me. Yes. I'm going to road test Robbie later, but first I'm meeting project lead, Professor Wasim Ahmed, to find out more about how it could impact the lives of people with sight loss. Robbie is not there to replace the guide dog. We know that people have emotional connection with their guide dog, but we are hoping that it can provide support in a short term if people are waiting to receive the guide dog. Some people, they have allergies. Not every blind and partially sighted people are eligible for guide dog. You know what, Vasim? I would absolutely love to just plug my dog in rather than pick up its poo. <laughs> <laughs> so how expensive is Robbie going to be? I mean, is it going to be affordable for most people? We will be building and working on various prototypes. The simplest one we are hoping that will be available for a few hundred pounds and up to the maximum Robbie with all the functionality will be up to five to six thousand pounds. The team has been working on Robbie for more than two years with volunteers like Alan helping with research. Today he's taken Robbie for a spin around the Hunterian Museum. I was thinking I could do one of these in a shopping centre or an airport. You know, airports are the worst when yeah. you arrive because they're so busy and you never know where you go. You've got to wait on people giving you assistance to find places. What sort of limitations have you found? Like, is there any challenges for Robbie? I think a guide dog has a rigid handle. Robbie needs a rigid handle to follow him. You'd obviously hope the batteries don't run out. I don't think they're quite going to replace the real guide dog at any point. I met my wife in a pub and she came over to talk to me about the dog. I don't know what you do that with a robot, do you reckon? Well, they do say that the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so it's my turn to take Robbie for a walk. I'm so excited. I can't believe this is about to happen. So I can feel a slight tug. It's amazing. So I've got it quite tight so I can feel where it's going. It's pulling me along. Oh, oh. Give me a description. On your right is the apparatus of determination of the OHO. The O, the unit of electrical resistance. Subsequently named after the German physicist Georg Simon Ohm. Oh my God, I'm so emotional with that. You know, I've, I've had to rely on sighted people to take me through a museum and it, it just feels so independent. It just feels so cool, you know, to be able to just do that. I mean, it'll just give blind people so much freedom. You know, we, we, we want to do things by ourselves. So this is so, so special. Robbie is still in development and it'll be around two years before he's properly unleashed and commercially available. They say that a dog is a man's best friend and although we won't be changing that to a robot anytime soon, in the not too distant future, you may well see them working side by side to help those with visual impairments. 
Amar's reaction there caught us by surprise, uh, didn't it? Because he's such a fun-loving guy, loads of energy, and then the realisation of how that robotic dog could help uh, people with sight loss is, um, was quite something, wasn't it? Freedom was the word yeah. for me. And hopefully the, 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 the robots are not too far away mm. either uh, to help. Maybe two years, fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, now, you might have seen uh, this story on Breakfast uh, this morning. Uh, weight loss jab could reduce heart attack risk. Now, this is the news. Doctors are suggesting uh, a diabetes drug called Azempic could revolutionise treatment for heart disease. Uh, now, Dr Oscar has been following this for Morning Live and he's here to tell us more. We've talked about Azempic so much, Dr Oscar. What do we need to know today? Well, remember what Azempic is. So Azempic is also known as uh, semaglutide, which is the generic name for the drug. Also, you might have heard of Wigovi, which has been the licensed weight loss version in the UK. So these are drugs that we've had for some time now for diabetes to help to treat uh, particularly type 2 diabetes. And what they do is they reduce appetite, so they act on the brain to mimic a, a hormone, a chemical that we have in our body that helps to tell us when we're full. And that weight loss is really helpful in the treatment of diabetes. We've also then been able to extend that to use it for helping people to lose weight who have other risk factors, and, and that's become incredibly popular. A lot of people have been getting that privately, even if they aren't able to get it through the NHS all of the time. Um, but what we're seeing now is very exciting new results coming out as a result that from a study which has shown over 17,000 people where they were looking at the benefits in terms of weight loss for these drugs but what they actually found was that as well as that weight loss you could see an improvement in the risk of cardiovascular disease mm. the, these drugs um have, have come up quite a few times when we've done the health headlines with you i know you've been following the research too so how is the drug how does it reduce the risk of heart disease and and reduce the potentially reduce strokes well, I wish I could tell you the, how it happens, Gethin, because nobody actually knows. But what's really interesting is that over three years, if you use this drug, and they did it in this trial, 17,000 people who had a history of heart disease, they were, had a 20% reduction in either strokes, heart attacks, or even cardiac death. So really hopeful. And that seems to be, from the initial data, independent of how much weight they lost. So it's a mechanism that isn't just about weight loss, but we don't entirely know why it is that they get that benefit so far. Um, we think perhaps there's something to do with inflammation within the body that increases the risk of those sorts of disease. But it's incredibly hopeful, um, you know, not only to help people lose weight, this medication, but if we can see that benefit from the cardiac perspective as well, that'd be really, really helpful. In fact, I was at a conference back in January where the cardiologists were talking about it in their kind of top thing in cardiology. So, you know, it's, it's amazing when we see something that started off as a diabetes drug now being incredibly helpful potentially for people with heart disease as well. It's amazing how it's evolved. It's diabetes, mm -hmm. then it's the sort of weight loss choice for mm -hmm. celebs and there's all the question marks. Now and now heart and strokes. And, and you yeah. keep saying how hopeful it is. So thank you for that, Dr Rusker. No doubt we will be coming back to you again and again as it comes up in the headlines. See you tomorrow. Yeah, get on the train. What are you doing hanging about? We need you tomorrow. Still so much to come this morning at 10.15. We'll tell you the top money wins for May, including how swapping bank accounts could bag you £175. Uh, then at 10.25, Michelin star chef Marcus Wearing is taking us to Provence for his brand new show. And we'll see how well the humble cheese toasty stacks up against the classic French croque monsieur. And at the end of the show, Neil is going to be teaching us the samba in Strictly Fitness. Yes, it's Samba Week. And we're, we're actually, it's, we're going like core as well today, but we've got a great movement from Danny and OT, and it's the chest pump. So that's the movement there that we're going to be working on, showing you how to do it. Geffen, I believe in you today. I I, I, feel, you're going to do it. I can feel your energy. It's going to be there. We've Basically, got it. For Samba. Um, there's crossed. more sparkles and sequins <laughs> from Neil. And 11 of his mates in Salford tonight. They're performing in Strictly, the professionals tour. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Strictly the Professionals 2024. Yes. 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 Yes.
Um, Vito, thank you for coming in. But, I mean, this show is just joy in every way, isn't it? Is it as much fun as it looks? It is. I mean, we're all pretty lucky to be going on tour with each other and doing what we do best, which is dancing. Um, but it's, it's an incredible show, and I think... Personally, this is our best one yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, it's a real treat if, if you do get to come along. I know you guys are coming along, which is exciting, but, yeah, you're you're in for a treat. There's, I feel like there's all the emotions. You're going to laugh with us, you're going to cry with us, smile, all, of, all of it. A lot Definitely of laugh, laugh yeah. at, at Mr at Neil, Neil Jones a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with and at. <laughs> More at than with, but... <laughs> that was kind of the theme last year, wasn't it? And I love the fact it's back this year, because yeah. it works so well. It, it, it every, does. But it's every it time works. they say, so, Neil, this is going to happen, I go, yeah, go Bring with it. it. it Bring it on. I Do think it. Neil's the star of the show, actually. <laughs> there were some incredible reviews last year. People absolutely loved it. Any, any surprises? What can you tell us about this year's tour? Oh, this tour is uh, surprising because it's completely different from last year. You know, every year it's like, oh, it's going to be the best one. And after there is something more, which this one now is the best. Mm -hmm. And we have also, you know, we have more. So there is like Graziano and Michelle with us. And we have Neil with like, you know, pranking us like backstage. But when we are <laughs> on the stage, we are, you know, it's like an exchange of energy with the people. What we like is to, to, to bring uh, our family directly to the people and to take the people to our bubble. You know, it's like, because sometimes we, we don't have the possibility to engage directly with yeah. them, but you have them, you know, and you really engage with them. I personally feel even when, when sometimes I turn, I see my sweat going on the people. Wait. And I say like, <laughs> and I say like, you know, we really have- You get that for Not free. just on the people, also on. <laughs> Us. Yeah, <laughs> we have this kind, you know, we give, we take, it's, it's an each other relationship with people. Yes. It's, it's amazing. Mm. So people yeah. can sweat back and you're Yeah, fine. yeah, we, we play. Yeah, I'm going to come off the floor and go, it's a little bit more slippery today. Me <laughs> too, sweating a lot. Well, you did say it is like a family and you are literally close and in every sense of the word. You, you kind of navigate life and you're on the road living in this bus. Mm -hmm. You're really supporting each other through every challenge of life, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, completely. You know, on the, like we say, like on the bus, mm -hmm. we're sat there I think most of the time we've had some really long journeys we're not all going to sleep sometimes I'm going to sleep yeah. on the floor uh, <laughs> yeah, Vito's normally talk. eating Oh, I'm eating. Always eating. Always eating. I'm in charge with the food. Yes, yeah. and the yeah. Nutella. We chat with uh, chocolate, with yeah. uh, everything, bread, pasta. We, we start we just to dress up. the same. Yeah, you see? This is what happens like when we're we around each other so planned, long. We thought that was planned, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> didn't I mean, get that memo. Practical things, like they were helping you with council tax and all sorts, like when you moved to the... <laughs> oh, my God, yes! 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 yes. <laughs> Listen, you just need Laura Pomfret in your life. You're going to be fine. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's, um, it's actually a really lovely element to it because we've been talking about Mental Health Awareness Week uh, this week, uh, Diane. I know that's something you're really aware of that you're happy yeah. to talk about. And actually, we always see you happy and out there on stage and performing. And we know dance can help with, yeah. with feeling positive too. Definitely. I think any kind of movement, but especially dancing because you're doing it to, to wonderful music, you're moving your body, you can express yourself. Like me personally, I find that I need dancing in my life because it, it gives me so much mental health clarity. Like, I, I love it so much. I couldn't imagine my life without it. Um, and I think we're all the same. It's like a real release of... Of, you know, if you're having a bad day, no matter what, I go and do a show and I feel so much more rejuvenated and better yeah, for it afterwards. Yeah. So, yeah, it's such a good thing for mental health. But you I... don't have to be professional. Like, that's no. in anyone. You just put some music on and just, you know, you don't have to be good. No. Just dance. I'm winging it. I'm winging you it. feel good. Yeah, Neil Jones wings it every night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it continues. Yeah. Yeah. You can see the theme here, can't yeah, you? Yeah, sure. can... yeah, yeah, for sure. But we feel that as well. Like, people do feel the joy when they watch it on the telly. You're in people's living rooms. And it's kind of nice, given that you've been so dedicated, working so hard. When we think about you as a youngster, all those years of hard toil. <laughs> that was a long time ago, yeah. How, Don't how worry, we have some pictures. I started when I was three. So, what, 39 years ago? So you're yeah. dancing as a three-year-old, but at what point... Oh, it, oh look at <laughs> Look at those curtains. It's Jonesy. pretty serious. At what point are you thinking, this can be my job? I, I didn't 
even when I was like, earning money from it, I didn't think it was going to be my job. I was still trying to think, where should I get a job? Like, I was working everywhere. I just enjoyed it, and I enjoyed winning trophies. That's why I did it. Oh, oh time trophies. world champion. He wins a trophy in the show as well. I do. That's yeah. a little. That's a little secret that I'm going to tell you all. Finally, win something. He wins a trophy in the show. I reckon there might be a twist a special to that. One. Yeah, there's a little twist to that. Uh, it sounds fantastic. <laughs> Good luck with you. You're all over the place. You still got about three weeks to go. You're all over the UK, aren't you? So. We are. Yeah. Yes. Um, not even halfway yet. No. Not even over three. <laughs> Luckily, we have so many things to do yet yeah, together. <laughs> Well, thank you for being guest members of our family and you are always welcome. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> we have to wave him off before the chef comes on because he will eat all the sandwiches. Oh, good point. <laughs> good <laughs> point, yeah. Still lots to come. Chef Marcus Waring will be giving his tips on French cooking, including the oil you should all be using as he tells us about his brand new BBC show, Marcus Waring, Simply Provence. He genuinely left a three-minute voicemail about olive oil for mm. me two weeks ago. Yes. It is not moving. He's waiting for the food. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, but now, with the news uh, that uh, the Bank of England is holding interest rates at a 16-year high at 5.25%, finance expert Lord Pomfret's uh, got her May money wins to help put some money back in your pockets. Laura, first of all, just remind us why bank switching can help. It can help because it's not doing anything extra and you can get money for just doing an act and, and moving some money around. And loyalty doesn't always pay off. You know, a lot of us sit around with the same bank account for a long time. I've said that before, they're not like football teams. You're allowed to switch and you can take advantage of this through a great service called the Current Account Switching Service. So I've used this lots. It's in the flow when you go through a bank switch, look for the logo, really important. They make sure everything is sorted and they take away, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the um, stress around whether it'll work. And so the first thing to think about is what do you want from a bank account? Are you doing this for good interest? Are you doing this for cash back? Do you, do you want extra facilities with your bank? Um, offers come and go. Like, if a lot of people take them, they will pull them off the market. And so this is about being ready and having accounts in place. And also thinking, like, what you want from a bank account. If you are about to take out a loan or a mortgage, just leave it. It can impact your credit score. Hold off for a bit later. Um, and at the moment, there's only two offering switching incentives on the main market. Tell us about those. So the first one is First Direct. Um, it's relaunched its bonus of the £175, which is literally just for switching your bank account. It's got no end date, but as I've said, they pull them all the time. Um, there's additional benefits with this one. It can You can access a linked regular saver with 7% interest on top, up to £300 a month, and a £250, not percent overdraft. Um, there's a little bit of eligi eligibility criteria with this. So 30 days of switching, you have to transfer or set up two direct debits or standing orders. You need to use the debit card at least five times. You need to log into mobile or online banking, which lots of us would do anyway, typically. And you need to pay a thousand pounds into the account. And if you do all this, you get 175 pounds in your bank account before the 20th of the following month. Top tip, the five transactions. <laughs> Me and my husband did this. You just sit and you get five pieces of chewing gum or like Mawam in the queue and just go ding, 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 and, and hold done. up the whole queue so that you can just qualify for your bonus. Yeah. It's actually five transactions. They do all offer different incentives though, don't they? They do, and a new one is the Virgin Money one. This is amazing. This is um, interest cash back. So what I mean by this is it's a bonus of extra interest because you've done the switch. With if You you can earn up to £120 if you deposit 1000 and leave it in for the whole year. You get 10% interest on that balance plus an extra 2% on the account anyway. Um, it's like a delayed cashback offer. You have to leave it in there for the year, but you can get up to £120. Offer is available just this month only for the rest of May. Um, it's on its M Plus and Club M accounts. Um, so all you need to do, same thing, complete the switch with two direct debits transferred by June 26th. Um, and like I said, you can earn up to £120 just by parking your £1,000 in there. I tell you what you see a lot of at the moment is the, is the cashback schemes. It feels like they become... Mm -hmm more popular than ever in the recent past. They really have. And you know what? This is about capitalising on spending. Mm. You are doing already. So this is not about going buying extra things. It's just a couple of extra life admin things. If you can get these things set up before you go shopping, apps like Jam Donut or Cheddar are great. They're free to download. They use open banking, which Iona talked about on the 29th of April. They, um, the users use it to purchase gift cards. So a gift card for the amount that you need and you, you spend it like either online or in store, and you're getting this extra cash back. Um, there's also some enhanced cash back for memberships, but first, just have a go at them. See how you feel, do you understand the process? Um, and, and if you're not comfortable with apps, 
websites like Top Cashback and Quidco are you know, two big ones that often compete with each other. So if you use these, sometimes you can use a plugin that sits on your browser and you don't even have to go to the website. So have a little look at that and you are getting cash back on things that you are shopping for already. You might not get it immediately, it might be seven days, so kind of bank it in the background, but lots of people use this cash back for like holidays or overpaying the mortgage or emergency savings. It's a great, great concept. But they're kind of like online versions of your loyalty cards, aren't they? They're just rewarding you for shopping. Mm. They are, and the key thing is do what you're doing anyway. Try not to overspend or get incentivized by the cash back because you might have spent more than you were going to stick within your own lane but make sure you're capitalizing on this free money that's on the table on the doing what you're doing anyway let's talk about groceries and the wins we can make there 100 percent. so groceries is the easiest way for people to make money and optimize on saving right so you, everyone's buying food we're doing it already Let's take the time to shop around. Now, online grocery shopping really boomed post-pandemic and lots of us embraced it. Me included, three children, busy life, actually not having to go physically into the store is a great convenience for me. And, and I think it's worth the money for me to do that. People with mobility issues really benefit from online shopping. The supermarkets are trying to help us do it more and there's loads of offers around at the moment. If we look at these, these are um, the main supermarkets. You can save up to £55 if you nail all these offers. So we've got Sainsbury's, mm -hmm. nationwide discounts for your first online spend. You can get £15 off if you spend uh, £80 minimum. Uh, you need to get that one delivered before the end of May. Ocado delivers across England and Wales. It offers new customers 25% off a minimum £60 order. That could be another 20 Iceland, nationwide offer, £5 off a 45 spend. Again, no end date for that offer. And lastly, at the moment, Morrison's. You can get £15 off a £60 spend. Uh, it's valid until the end of May. You back-to-back -back all those offers. That's £55 off your grocery shop 30, and delivered to, to your door. 30 40% discounts. Great, Massive. And as you say, uh, Iona Bain, our finance expert, touched on the, the cashback scheme there. April 29, still on iPlayer 2. Loads of information for you. Of course, money worries and work stresses are some of the biggest causes of anxiety and, and some jobs can come with extra pressures. Presenter and campaigner Ben West has been to meet a group of firefighters to share his tips to keep their mental health in check, including how focusing on their senses can make a difference. One in four people will experience a mental health problem of some kind each year in England. And things like stress, anxiety and depression can be profoundly affected by our five senses. But the good news is that by taking control of these senses with a few simple exercises, we can boost our mental health. Work is a common cause of stress, and it doesn't get much tougher than working in the emergency services. Firefighters like this group in Watford are among those dealing with the most serious emergencies. In your role, what are some of the, the difficult situations that you attend to? For me, I think, without a shadow of a doubt, the hardest thing to deal with is, is a fatality. We're trained to quite a high level to our actual job, so until afterwards, you don't really think of that. That's when the impact starts to build and layer up. How comfortable do you feel talking about mental health generally? I think there can be a bit of a stigma sometimes attached to the word mental health. So I think it's probably something we've recognised for a long time, but haven't actually stuck a label on it. Um, and I think we're good at recognising it within, within each other without necessarily labelling it as, as mental health. I've got some tips on how these firefighters could take time out to deal with stress. So today we're going to focus on three techniques that involve using our senses. This first exercise costs nothing and can be done almost anywhere. Close your eyes, just really relax, just notice your breathing and then what I'd like you to do is open your eyes and use our sense of sight to find five different objects and just notice how they look, their shape, their colour. Focusing on our senses in the here and now can help us stop worrying about past events that can't be changed or future events that may not happen. It can be used with any of the senses, like touch. So the clothes you're wearing, how do they feel? Are they heavy, are they light? You can feel the soles of your feet, the weight of your body pressing into the bottom of your shoes. Hearing. I can hear a train, the wind, people talking. Identify where they're coming from, what they sound like. Smell and even taste. Today, we've gone through each sense in turn, but you can pick just one or two of them if you prefer. So that took us less than five minutes and you can do it anywhere, right? Um, so how do we find that? You had to really concentrate and I can hear that train over there. I can hear that, that clicking, I can hear the wind. Um, I found that quite, quite relaxing. 
I have to happen to the point I heard a siren. Yeah. But, <laughs> You're back in work. But no, it's better, yeah. yeah, better I was trying to get away from. Yeah, I'll definitely give it a shot in the future. Yeah. My next exercise uses the humble ice cube to distract if your mind is worrying. Take a piece of ice into your hands and focus on how it feels in your palm and fingertips. The cold sensation can help redirect your thoughts. The sudden cold of ice can jolt you out of anxiety and back to the present. If you don't have ice cubes, anything from the freezer would also work. Holding that ice did definitely just tunnel my thoughts to the ice and would push out or ease away other thoughts. I can see how that would be a exercise for me, just, you know, if it, it, in a panic situation. It forces you to focus on, on something else, and that works for me. Oh, I really liked it. Thank Yay! You. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. My final mini exercise involves the sense of smell. When our brain stores memories, it stores them with extra information like smells. And so when we smell something from where we felt good, it can actually bring on the exact same feelings that we felt in that moment. For this exercise, we've picked smells that might be particularly nostalgic. Cinnamon, Play-Doh, crayons and freshly cut grass. Some of them smells were really took me back to my childhood and, and a safe place. That was really quite interesting and probably for me the most powerful uh, of today. Okay, wow. If you have any mental health concerns, it's advisable to speak to a professional. But if your mind just needs a mini break from whatever stress you have going on, taking a moment out to engage your senses could help relax and reinvigorate you for the day ahead. Remember, using our senses to reconnect with the present moment is something that we can all do at home for free. Yeah, and actually, it, they all reacted to different things. Some were really into the sort of the smell, reminding them of the past, and then the ice cubes were sort of taken by surprise. So whatever it is, taking a little moment can help. I love the term mini break for the mind. I'm going to adopt yeah. that one. We've used touch, sight and smell, but now we're getting a taste of France. Yes, for his latest BBC show, Michelin-starred chef Marcus Waring has packed up his pots and pans and headed for Provence. <laughs> There is one special place where I worked as a young chef. That has remained close to my heart. I didn't think I'd come to France and find the Barnsley Chop. And one region in particular that is full of passionate producers and incredible ingredients. This is Provence. We are going to be discovering the secrets of the very best and simplest French cooking. Glorious. Everything about that makes me smile, as oh. does this face. Marcus joins us now. Good morning, <laughs> sir. I mean, I don't even need to ask what inspired you to make this series. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, nice to see you. A little bit better weather there than, well, when I'm looking at the back of your picture there. <laughs> what a glorious time you must have had. Oh, it's fabulous. I'm very lucky to, to, to be or to be given the opportunity to go into what is effectively the Garden of France, which is Provence, and a small place called Saint-Rémy. Uh, and, and the journey of, of discovering the humble cuisine of, of what, what, what's made France great. Um, and, but it's all, it, it all stems around fabulous ingredients that a region like Saint-Rémy and Provence grow. They, yes, they've got the climate, They've got the height. They've got the they've got the, hill, the small little mountains surrounding the area as well to protect, and it keeps everything. Everything is just warm and delicious mm. and just just lovely. Yeah, it comes through the screen. You can feel that. You you say it's like a voyage of discovery, and it's weird, isn't it? Because we we look at you and we think you're a top chef. You know it all, but actually, you never really stop learning, do you? Well, that's something that I don't agree with. I don't know it all. Um, I know what I do and I'm trained in the style of French cuisine, um, but I've never been into the heart and soul of people's communities before because my whole life has been in kitchens, and it, and it, and it has. Um, but we, talk, we do chefs sometimes can take supply chain for granted. Um, sort of now taking a slight back street from the fine dining world, or back seat, I should say, from the fine dining world, um, I want to go and discover what makes food really great, not from the fine dining point of view, but more for the everyday eating, the everyday ingredients that we all buy. And because I was trained in the style of French food, you know, in the 80s and 90s, well, my, my exams at Catering College were all in, 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 in the food of France. Uh, and so as I went into kitchens, I continued. And so you become ingrained in that world. And um, having done Tales from a Kitchen Garden and seen the community around Kent and East Sussex, 
this was a, an opportunity for me to do exactly the same in what I consider to be the base of, of who I am as a chef, really. So it was really all about going to see what the French do. You touched on community and <clears throat> supply chain. Do you think that's why French food is good? Because they look at produce and farming in a completely different way, don't they? They do, and their, their farming is, is breathtaking. It's a family. Their families generally, they're community-based. They support each other in the marketplaces. You don't see your big shopping chains uh, around the area. You see marketplaces popping up all over the place. And you can see in this picture here, it's, you know, there's 50-plus 50, 50 tomatoes in that shot there by a farmer who, who grows pretty much organic but in a field full of weeds. And it's interesting to find that you find a supplier on a stall with 50 plus varieties of tomatoes, yeah, 50. Yeah. You know, that's quite extraordinary. And they're just breathtaking, breathtaking people as well. Uh, tell us what you discovered about um, something that, that we all use quite a lot to cook, olive, olive oil. You got an exclusive here. Oh, I mean, the, <laughs> the, 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 the landscape is littered with olive trees, of ancient olive trees. And, you know, you, you go to an olive maker or a supplier and they lay out 10, 15 flavours of, of olive oil. Then you go through a masterclass with them and you have a little flavour of what makes them great. Great. And of course, it's like winemaking. It's complex, it's detailed. But the olive trees themselves, but what I discovered, for instance, is the, the varieties, that all olives are grown green and they change as they go, as they grow old. And, and some stay green, some stay go turn black. Um, but it was the green bottles. I didn't realise it was there to stop sunshine from destroying or damaging the oil. Um, which was like, I never realised why the bottle was green. And just simple little <laughs> things that you think, why didn't I know that? Why didn't I know that? And that's why I'm on this journey, to find little tips that we all should be looking at. And I just want to highlight basic little f fun things, like fun facts like that. So if I start using better olive oil, is my cooking going to be elevated to a French cuisine type level? <laughs> So, well, th just remember, with the, the, the more expensive the oil, the more complex it is. And uh, uh, the virgin olive oils is the first press of the, of the olive. Um, but that's taken it. Uh, the, 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 there are people who go around the olive trees tasting olives every single day to pick them at the right time. So that's the extra virgin olive oil. And then the, the secondary presses and third presses are the slightly cheaper versions. Use olive oil as a finisher. You know, people say you must never cook with olive oil. The reason being is it, 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 it doesn't work at high temperatures. It changes its structure and gets a little bit bitter and broken down. Um, so use it as a finisher. I do tend to fry with it a little bit, even believe it or not. There's a, there's, a, there's a doctor's reason as to why you shouldn't cook with olive oil. But I'm not a doctor, so don't ask me that question. Uh, <laughs> or I don't know the answer to that one. But that's what I'm told anyway. Right, well, well, use, it, use, it, use it gently. Don't, don't overuse it. We'll put that question to one of our many doctors on Morning Live over mm. the coming weeks. Um, Mark, That's uh, what I thought would be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely bit of, uh, bit of olive oil and a nice bit of bread. Who doesn't enjoy that? Uh, in fact, it's bread that features heavily on tonight's show. Yes, it does. And um, surprisingly, I go to a baker who is all about this, this gentleman here. I mean, he's, it was just like for me working with the masters of the kitchens I've worked in. A passionate man who makes his, he grows his own wheat, he makes his own flour, he, he bakes his own bread and, he, and he's all organic and he's just a beautiful man doing his thing. But he just has this passion for, for sourdough so much he doesn't even serve or sell or make baguettes. I mean, who, who would believe there was a bakery in France without a baguette in it? No. Nope. He refuses. He doesn't want to cook it at all. Love it. Love it. I eat so much bread. In fact, we lived in France. The bread is so much better there. We've got a load of sandwiches in front of us. You wanted to answer the age-old question Ooh. about... We wanted you to be here cooking us French cuisine, but we've somehow got ham and cheese sandwiches <laughs> instead. Um, we've got croque monsieur <laughs> versus your English ham and cheese toasty. Mm. What, what's the difference? How do we make this French? <clears throat> Well, well, first of all, um, the one thing we do have and we can claim is that we invented the Great British Sandwich. And that's effectively what the Croque Monsieur is. It's the French version of this sandwich that we Brits invented. So, you know, I was, I was certainly planting the flag in, in, in St. Remy about the, the sandwiches. And as you can see in that picture there, I'm making my toasty in a pan with lots and lots of French butter. That's the oh. difference. Come on in. So this is your, this is, your, is this the French <clears throat> effort, Marcus? Oh, That's the French one there, yeah, yeah. Which is your classic croque monsieur. 
It's famous. You've got you got cheese inside and ham, and you've got even more cheese. But remember, there's maybe the vegetable. Both these sandwiches are very similar. Um, and the one that is the, the, my my version that I'm sure would taste a lot better than the one that you're about to taste if I was there doing it with you. But I can't. There we are. There it is. I'm going um, to be honest. It's, it's, it's a toasty at the end of the day. It's a toasty. Your version is sensational. I mean, I'm happy with both, I'll Maybe. be honest. No. They are good, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Marcus, will you come and make it in person next sim- time, please? They're, ve- they're very similar, and I would love to come up and make it in person next time. Oh, thank you so much Delicious. for joining us, Marcus. You are a joy in many, many ways. <laughs> These are going to keep you. us going, aren't they? Yeah, you guys <laughs> get your own, all right? <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. You can watch Marcus wearing Simply Provence Monday to Thursday, 6.30 on BBC Two and iPlayer. Delicious in every single way. Now, it's not just food that France is famous for. Paris is one of the fashion capitals of the world. But trends come and go, and every year Brits chuck out 300,000 tonnes of unwanted clothing. So we take a look back to when presenter Jackie Joseph looked into some clever ways to help you make do and mend and help reduce waste. The average Brit spends over £500 a year on clothes. But with a bit of know-how, it's easy to make your clothes last a bit longer and save yourself some money along the way. You don't need to be an expert tailor with loads of time on your hands. There are some simple and affordable bits of kit that will help you give your tired clothes a new lease of life fast. A simple sewing kit is essential for basic repairs. This is the first thing you've got to have in your kit easy thread needles. It is a game changer. And let me show you exactly how it works. So, rather than just an eye of the needle, you have got slots. Hold the thread taut, and then just press down into the actual slot. And you're ready to sew. Add to that two pairs of scissors. The bigger one is for heavy fabrics like denim, threads, Get a variety of colours, but you'll definitely need black and white. Pins to hold that fabric in place and a tape measure. Grab an old shoebox to keep it in and all this kit could cost you as little as £7. But not all repairs need a sewing kit. Shaving is a great way to bring bobbly jumpers back to life and there's an option to suit most budgets. Now, I know that this jumper's got a bit of life left in it, but it's a bit scruffy. You can see there's lots of bubbling there, or pilling, to use the technical term. We're gonna revive this jumper by shaving it. So the first one I'm going to use is a battery-operated shaver. And you can see it's removing all of the bubbles. This is really easy, actually. Next up, a more environmentally friendly battery-free option. And it is actually a clothes shaver. It does take a bit longer. A bit more elbow grease, but the results are worth it. Yeah, that's looking good. Yeah, that's great. Plenty more wear, this jumper. If you're confident with your sewing, but don't have the space or money for a full sewing machine, this next gadget's for you. Costing around £12.99, a handheld sewing machine will speed up a range of little jobs. So I've got just a pair of school trousers, actually, that I need to hem. I'm using white thread, so you can see exactly what I'm doing. If you do plan to buy one of these nifty little gadgets, do check to make sure that they will do what you need them to. For example, they're not great with tough materials like denim. And there you have it, hemmed trousers. So it really can be cheap and easy, and more importantly, quick, to keep some items in your wardrobe going for that bit longer. All you need are the right tools. And now you know what tools you need. Thank you to JJ for that. Great stuff. Uh, thanks for your messages uh, and your questions uh, for the show uh, today. Uh, we've got um, something for everyone, I think. Laura, we're going to start with you because you're talking about making our money go a bit further yeah. uh, a bit earlier on, talking about delivery wins, groceries. Um, you talked about lots of different uh, supermarkets. Um, a bit of a clarification on the Ocado shop. So the Ocado one, you can get 25% off your first order as long as it's a minimum of £60 and then it's capped at 20 Lovely, thank you for that. Uh, Hayley, you were talking to us about the latest WhatsApp scam. Mm-hmm. Linda's been in touch to say, 
Is it the same to set up two-step verification on both Android and Apple phones? Basically, yes. The settings is in a different place. Your settings button is in the top right on your Android phones, but you still go settings, account, two-step verification, and it does the same job. There you go. You're seeing it on the screen there. Like we were saying before, sometimes just get the help of someone who's really good at IT uh, to help you manoeuvre through that to keep you safe online. Uh, Ranj talking about hay fever, talking yes. about colds, talking about lots of different things. David, uh, I've been diagnosed with rhinitis. Yep. Uh, is this the same as hay fever? Yep. So rhinitis is uh, a, a umbrella term. It just describes inflammation within the nose, as it were. And hay fever is a type of rhinitis, but there are other types of rhinitis as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean you've got hay fever. It could be one of the other ones. Uh, Dr. Oscar, we were talking about a Zempic today all over the papers. People will be wondering what's going on. The demand is really up there. We've had a comment uh, from someone saying, my daughter used a Zempic to control her type 2 di diabetes. Because of the demand for those wanting to use it for weight loss, we've had real problems trying to get her prescription filled when she needed it. Because there wasn't any in chemists, it made me really anxious. This is really difficult for people using it for type 2 diabetes, particularly because of the demand. There has been a huge supply issue um, over last year. Perhaps some of it's been slightly better this year, but there are still significant problems. I think the best advice is that you can go and speak to the pharmacist. Sometimes they're able to get some access to it. There is an oral version, so a tablet version of semaglutide that some people are, might be able to switch over to. Um, obviously, really important to keep your diabetes well controlled. So if you're struggling, speak to your GP and they will guide you to alternatives that are currently available. But it, it has been really tricky. Things will hopefully improve. Mm. Uh, loads of messages about hay fever, as you probably imagine, Ranj. Uh, David, if you haven't had hay fever before, can you develop it later? Yes, you can develop it at any stage. In fact, you developed it later, I developed didn't you? it about age 37. There you go. Oh, oh, no. Can happen to anyone. I know. OK. Um, and, you know, we're talking about um, busting myths, and I think it was James, or Will, was it, saying that can local honey yeah. help with hay mm. fever? What about this? Uh, this is from Tom. My grandson was advised once to take a teaspoon of turmeric in the morning. So turmeric has got anti-inflammatory um, and some antihistamine type properties, but it's quite weak and it's not particularly great at helping with hay fever, but it's probably not going to cause any harm. It worked for Tom. Yeah. Uh, grandson. Go. He said it was brilliant and stopped the symptoms. So, yes, not, there's no harm using it. No, yeah. unlikely to be. Good That's advice. Good, um, I think we need to get to Strictly Fitness because Neil's got friends today. Oh, and yes. To be honest, they're tickling him, they're poking him, they're distracting him. <laughs> In the naughty corner over there, they're helping him limp Get a full on massage. <laughs> Let's save him then. Play the music. Hear the music. <laughs> Here we are, Strictly Fitness, and I've got my friends. Um, it's brilliant. We're doing samba. You love a samba, and you love a samba, don't you, as well? And it's really good because we've got OT and Danny Max samba, and we're working on the chest. I know, Vito, you're not going to let me down on this. You're going to be pushing. He's got the energy for the whole group today. Um, but we've actually got, so I'm going to show them how to do the body pops now. OK, so the first thing I want you to think about is your bottom ribs. And I want you to just push that forward as much as you can. So stretching and moving back. So you're, you're really getting that hollow movement and pushing as much as you can. So it's also a nice stretch. So that's what's happening there. I think it's like a upper body twerk. That's what's Whoa. happening. We can go faster with that. OK, but we've got two more movements that we're going to be doing because this is a core exercise well. So we've got hip circles, which you can go really small and isolated, or Vito, show them the bigger ones. Go on, go on Vito. Oh. Yeah, that's what it's about. So we've got that you one. you made of rubber? And then we've got the ab rotation. So we're going to take the arms and keep it in, and you're just twisting. So you want to isolate your hips and take the arms around as much as you can. You can keep them small or out wide. I won't do it wide here because I'm going to hit you. Neil, first sitting down, what's the exercise? It's perfect what you're doing. So where you're there sat down, you've got the nice twist. But also, even though you're sat, you can also get a little bit of rotation in your hips while sitting. You or sure? you can go also upper body. And again, perfect isolation, pushing back and forth. Lovely. That All is right. really good. And we are admiring your arch and your foot, which is really good. Good to go? <laughs> yes, we're ready. Take it away, Alan. With a mid-body workout, okay, so go it's Neil Jones. Oh. 